Great. Okay, so I'm a professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And, you know, in terms of collaboration, uh, I think I want to define my expertise and what I can add in this, in this short talk. And basically, I'm an experimentalist. You know, the field of material science of engineering, I'm in the subdiscipline of electronic materials. And within that, I focus on thin film materials. And I know we think of electronic materials as, you know, semiconductors, mostly silicon, germanium, uh, you know, electro-optic materials. Uh, and I have dealt with those, but actually I tend to focus in metallic materials as electronic materials, metals. And, uh, and what I'll focus on sort of an example today is my work on semiconductor device interconnects. So uh, before I get there, let me just do a uh, uh, a basic definition of what this material science of thin films is all about. Uh, so on the, uh, the image here, we have sort of what I call the jellium view of a thin film structure. So this one, its purpose is actually a magnetic recording layer. So the three layers shown in, in red are actually, uh, you know, the hard magnetic material that stores information data uh, for, for your computer. And then there's a, a three-layer structure underneath it, which is intended to uh, optimize the properties of the magnetic recording layer. And on top of that is a, uh, is a carbon overcoat. So, you know, there's a head that flies above this uh, magnetic media. This would be the coating on the disc that's spinning. And we have to keep that head from uh, causing wear and ripping it up. So the jellium view is kind of a standard view uh, that many people might have. It corresponds to, you know, you put down a layer of this, you put down a layer of that, and so on as you build it up. But the uh, material science view looks more like this. And, and this is a cross-sectional TEM uh, of exactly that same structure. Uh, and uh, what we see here is, you know, this cobalt layer you know, has varying differences of dark and light, and that actually indicates uh, different crystallites. You know, uh, a cross-sectional TEM image is somewhat similar to an, you know, an X-ray uh, image of your of your hand or something looking for a broken bone, where you tend to get lighter colors where the beam goes through, uh, less dense material. Uh, with electrons, you actually can get. Uh, uh, sort of the beam deflected by a diffraction process. And that gives you uh, sort of dark areas and, and, and light areas in contrast. So uh, what we're actually seeing here is these dark and light areas in this sort of cobalt layer uh, are actually different crystals. You know, they're, they're at a different orientation to the beam. And uh, this whitish layer on top is amorphous. That's the carbon. That's a, a diamond-like carbon for uh, uh, for uh, you know, wear protection. Uh, this uniform gray layer uh, down at the bottom here is the, uh, is the substrate uh, that, the, that the disc sits on. And then we see that this chrome layer, uh, which is that underlayer structure, uh, we can see that it's also uh, polycrystalline. And we also see rather interestingly that the, uh, some of the light and dark patterns between the cobalt layer and the underlayer uh, match up. And what's going on there is epitaxy. Uh, I know everyone's familiar with epitaxy in terms of uh, electro-optic devices and band gap engineering and uh, you know, semiconductor growth. But actually epitaxy is a very common phenomena occurring in thin films and in metallic thin films. And this epitaxy is actually crucial uh, to the performance of this uh, the chrome layer in this case is a BCC crystal structure. It comes up with a preferred crystallographic orientation when deposited correctly, and that influences the orientation of the HCP uh, hexagonal uh, cobalt base layer to be uh, correct, to give correct properties. So that's what I mean by material science of thin films. Uh, we go past this jellium view and actually uh, optimize material properties. Now, semiconductor interconnects, uh, you know, we all know that there are billions or trillions, however uh, many you want to consider of devices on a wafer, and uh, they're all packed together very, very tightly. 
uh, but they're also wired uh, one to another. You know, your basic uh, uh, transistor is a three-wire device, current in, current out, and, uh, and a switching current at the gate. So uh, this is a very old image of sort of one micron size wires, the wires, but it gives you an idea of the three-dimensional network of them that is, uh, is what exists. Uh, and this, you know, the, the, the spaces between the wires are, are filled with uh, SiO2 uh, or some variation thereof, a dielectric. And in this particular image to get you uh, this picture of the SiO2 was etched away, leaving just the copper wires. Now, a uh, material property of interest for material scientists here is the resistivity of the copper, because obviously that's going to determine the resistance of the wire. And as you see, these wires are sort of adjacent to other wires. So that means when I'm trying to push a current through a wire, uh, these other wires tend to serve as ground planes and I get capacitance. And that gives me an RC signal delay. So the resistance of wires is crucial to that. I'm old enough, and perhaps some of you are as well, to remember when desktop computers uh, would double their processor speed, their base processor speed, their clock speed, uh, every generation. You know, went from 33 megahertz to 66, 133, 266, all the way up. But about uh, a decade or so ago, it stopped at uh, two to three gigahertz where we are now uh, today. And what was going on there is it used to be uh, the delay, uh, signal delay was in, the, uh, was in the MOSFET itself, was in the transistor, was in the semiconductor. Uh, but that went away as the semiconductor portion got smaller and smaller physically. Uh, but this RC delay of the interconnects uh, did not go away. And so that's what's limiting our clock speeds today. Uh, the other thing that's going on is uh, the simple resistance in this wire with the current necessary to propagate signals is giving us I squared R heating and power loss. And this is turning into uh, actually a fairly huge deal because uh, in sort of our latest generation of uh, microprocessors, the interconnect power loss is about 80% of the total power loss and heat generation in the device. So all these things have been scaling with Moore's law. You know, the, uh, the nominal node is, you know, here's just sort of an example going from a 45 nanometer node to the 14 nanometer node. I think we're about the nine nanometer node today. Uh, in the old days, the node referred to a physical dimension. That's no longer true. Uh, what we have here is the pitch. So that's the wire center to wire center spacing at the smallest uh, wire uh, uh, level, uh, you know, decreasing with node being about 52 nanometers for the 14 nanometer node, which means that the, uh, the line width of the wire is about 26 nanometers. And you can see from these images, it's a very complicated multi-layer uh, schedule. Uh, I think today they're up around 12 to 18 layers of metal uh, layers of separate wires, all interacting with one another. And the material of choice since about 1990 has been copper. And uh, the problem with copper is it's a very nice low resistivity metal, about 1.7 microhm centimeters, but it gets that low resistivity from a long electron mean free path, which is to say at room temperature, the electrons get to go fairly good distance, in this case, 39 nanometers at room temperature before they're scattered by a phonon generating resistance. Now, when I start making uh, either films or wires smaller uh, than that or near that or less, uh, I get scattering off the walls, quite literally. And, uh, and so the copper resistivity has been increasing as wire dimensions shrink. You know, this was first uh, noted as a concern, you know, a couple decades back. As I mentioned, it's now 80% of the power and uh, the copper interconnect resistivity increase known as classical size effect has been sort of a grand ch uh, challenge in the international uh, technology roadmap for semiconductors uh, for uh, more than a decade. Now, here's some of my own work in that. And this is sort of a classic plot of sort of copper layer thickness, i.e. dimension uh, versus resistivity. 
and the the solid line here, uh, you know, the upper data is room temperature, the lower is liquid helium, where you freeze out all the phonons, and uh, you know the solid line is the uh, sort of the preferred model for surface scattering uh, that's been used and widely used to explain this type of uh, of uh, resistance increase with size, so classical size effect, and. Uh, we can see that you know, at a given layer thickness, there's sort of a range of resistivities being observed. And some of the higher ones are associated with a slightly different material at the copper interface, you know, which might be understood as uh, uh, affecting the amount of scattering at the interface. The inability of the uh, sort of the accepted model to, uh, to, sh to uh, look at how big the resistivity in increase is had always been sort of band-aided with various models that assumed the surface roughness was sort of an additional contributor. These types of plots are very easy to make. Resistivity can be, uh, resistance can be measured, you know, with, with three or four digit accuracy uh, without any problem. And th for instance, the thickness of a layer can be measured, you know, within sort of a few tenths of an angstrom with techniques like X-ray reflectivity, which were done here. So this scatter here is not really noise at all. Uh, it's some real phenomena that's independent of layer thickness. Uh, so being a good material scientist, we did things like uh, look again at the uh, crystal structure of this, and it's polycrystalline, uh, copper tends to twinning. Uh, and what we did was to actually quantify the, uh, the grain size here and this was very laborious because of the contrast in, in copper. Uh, it was actually a grad student hand tracing grain boundaries uh, on a transparency as shown here in image C. And this wonderful grad student did this uh, over at least 22 samples and 19,144 grains. So extremely laborious, which is why nobody had ever done it before. But when you do that, you can take these same resistivity values and now plot them against the copper grain size. And, and what you see is, ooh, it, it tracks grain size extremely well, much better than it tracks thickness. And what's going on here is, you know, grain boundary scattering had been known as a, as a phenomena, but it had never really been quantified well in these things. And, uh, uh, it's really the dominant feature uh, rather than the surface scattering. And you know, the, as, as, was, as was published a decade ago, uh, there is a surface scattering component, uh, but grain boundary scattering is, is, is clearly dominant. Uh, so uh, what you would wanna do then is uh, look at wires that don't have uh, grain boundaries, which is to say single crystal wires. And so we started looking at single crystal tungsten. So now we have to uh, use a single crystal substrate to get a single crystal layer of metal. And uh, it was a very high quality single crystal. Uh, it's exhibited by the X-ray diffraction, electron diffraction, and uh, transmission electron image. And what we did with this high quality layer was about 20 nanometers thick, is we patterned it into lines of differing widths in different crystallographic directions. So if you have a single crystal film with a 1-1-0 orientation, there are these other fundamental crystallographic orientations, you know, of the 1-1-0 family, of the 1-0-0 family, and the 1-1-1 family uh, that are available in the plane of the film. And you can simply use E-beam lithography and pattern lines and measure the resistivity of those lines. And it, we found that it mattered. And that's what's shown over here on, on the right-hand side, where the resistance increase for lines along a 100 or 110 direction was about twice that of the resistance increase along a 111 direction. And what's going on here is understood really more deeply into the physics of it. Uh, what's shown here is a the Fermi surface of, uh, of tungsten. Uh, so uh, can I still be heard out there? Yes, please. Well, could you please wrap up soon? 
Okay. We are over the time. Case, so uh, the Fermi surface is anisotropic, the Fermi velocity is anisotropic, and the mean free path is anisotropic. So the distance at which you in, introduce scattering uh, depends on the physical dimension. So even though it's a cubic material, we've broken symmetry by making a wire, and, and that makes a difference. So we're continuing to look at single crystal materials now, uh, looking with uh, ruthenium, and we're seeing very high quality of surfaces, even when uh, we embed them in dielectric. And so we're getting fundamentally uh, uh, specular scattering. Uh, ruthenium is of interest because it does not suffer as greatly from uh, the size effect resistivity increase. So uh, in terms of acknowledgments, uh, we're getting funding NSF, SRC, AFOSR. Uh, I have some students. I'd like to point out my collaborators, Dr. Caden, uh, ex doing experimental work. For instance, the surface science part of this, Dr. Schelling and Luciolo and UCF Physics are doing atomistic modeling and also working with uh, Dr. Barmack and Dr. Thompson and Dr. Gall uh, at other institutions. I'm also active as a co-PI with Dr. Son here at UCF uh, doing diffusion-related work funded by ARL and, D ARL and DOE. So my collaboration interests quite generally are thin films, their processing and characterization. So I could benefit your, you know, I'm not making devices in a final way at all. I'm, I'm deep into uh, the material side of it only. And, uh, and so if you have a uh, thin film material that's not doing what you want, then I may be able uh, to help. Thank you very much.